Today's video is another compilation of some of the worst tragedies that I've covered on this channel, from the tallest mountain in the world to a massive cave collapse, the Savage Mountain, and finally covering the unclimbable south face of Lhotse. This video will revisit some familiar locations. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and as always, viewer discretion is advised. Dr. Marissa Stridham was a high achiever, full of energy, a real zest for life. Her great loves, her husband Robert, and their shared passion for climbing the world's highest mountains. But deep in the Everest death zone, 8,000 metres up, disaster struck. When Robert Grapple reached the peak of the world on May 20th, 2016, it was supposed to be the pinnacle of his climbing career, an accumulation of his life's work that had started at eight years old but instead, he felt empty. It wasn't what he imagined, not because of the view or the accomplishment, but because he stood on the roof of the world alone. His 34-year-old wife, Dr. Maria Stridham, had not been able to reach the summit with him, as she stood just below Rob on the south summit of Everest, completely spent and suffering from high altitude sickness, but nobody was prepared for what would happen next. This is their story. Yep, we're back to Mount Everest, a mountain that I find myself spending countless hours reading about, and this week's story is no different as we travel back to the tallest peak on our planet. In May of 2016, Robert Gruppel and his wife Maria Stridham would find themselves at the base camp of Mount Everest with the goal of finally reaching the roof of the world together, a goal they had been striving towards and manifesting for years. Rob had been climbing since he could walk, when he was eight years old, he would summit his first peak in the Cathedral Range, and he would never look back. He loved climbing, and after meeting Marie at Queensland Uni while studying vet science, the pair became inseparable. Maria would eventually graduate with a degree in finance, but quickly developed a love for the outdoors alongside Rob. After they were married and moved to Melbourne, Australia, the couple would set a goal together, climb some of the world's highest mountains, and the king of them all, Mount Everest. They were both experienced, but the tallest mountain on earth was a level up from the climbs that they were accustomed to. Both Rob and Maria's family did not oppose the challenge, but they were weary and several times questioned the pair if they were sure that this is what they wanted. Weeks before their trip to base camp, they would send their wills to their family, further increasing the stress as it was the first realization that what they were doing was truly dangerous and Maria's mother would fly to Melbourne just to say goodbye and good luck to her daughter, as she had a feeling that she just needed to see her. Hearing Maria's mother's voice crack while listening to her recount the days before the trip was intense and made the hairs along my neck stand up. I cannot imagine the feeling, knowing your loved one is about to do something incredibly dangerous, but also that it was something that she felt like she had to do. But even as Rob and Maria's parents waved them goodbye, they still expected to see them come back through that door weeks later, just as they always had. For those of you that don't know, 2016 was the first climbing season after the infamous 7.8 magnitude earthquake that would strike Nepal and the surrounding countries in 2015. It was devastating, and even today there are still remnants of the damage throughout the surrounding areas, with some of the small communities being completely destroyed. 22 people would lose their lives on Everest during the base camp due to the quake, and thousands more would lose their life throughout the country. There is a fantastic Netflix documentary called Aftershock that describes the events of that day in great detail. Since most of the 2015 season was spent recovering from the earthquake, nobody would summit the mountain that year, and many companies and climbers were anxious to get back in 2016. When Rob and Maria walked into base camp after the usual week-long hike, well, it was nice and crowded with rows of tents prepping for the busy season. Rob and Maria were there with three Sherpas, and they would begin the acclimatization process almost immediately as they would be climbing the South Call route. Acclimating to the environment is crucial on Everest and is done by gradually making your way up the mountain to one of the various camps, spending some time, typically a day or night at the higher altitude, then climbing back down to base camp to rest, 
refuel, and repeat. You would continue this process until you are acclimated as best as possible to the environment and the right opportunity presents itself to make the final summit push. Rob and Maria would spend six weeks climbing to the various camps on the mountain, then descending. It would be mid-May by the time that they finally felt ready, and unlike most stories told on this channel, the weather was perfect for climbing. They would make their way up the mountain the first few days, traveling quickly and honestly having no issues reaching Camp 3 at 7,162 meters. But it was here, just under the death zone, that we all know that the real danger begins. The oxygen in the air is a fraction of what it is at sea level, and your body literally begins to die, one cell at a time. The danger is in the name, and spending any large quantity of time at that altitude, well it typically does not end well. Rob and Maria of course knew that they were on a time limit, and that is why they prepared to leave Camp 3 at nearly midnight so they could reach Camp 4 in the early morning. This is where they would enter the death zone, but they would rest before making the final push less than 24 hours from their current time. But everything is slow, and it would take them along with their three Sherpas nearly two hours to get ready. If the altitude and exhaustion doesn't kill you, one simple mistake certainly can, as the only light illuminates from each climber's headlamps reflecting off the snow and rock. It was below negative 30 degrees, and the terrain is brutal, but nobody said it would be easy. Rob and Maria's family would watch the pair's progress through a satellite tracker, praying for them both, as that was all the support that they could lend. It was a little after 11 a.m. when Rob and Maria would stumble into Camp 4, just above 8,000 meters. They were behind schedule, and the clock was ticking, but they still had time to rest before making their final push. At 7 p.m. that night, Maria and Rob would finally begin the last push with their three Sherpa companions. The conditions couldn't have been more perfect, as there had been nothing but clear skies, and the plan was to reach the summit and return back to Camp 4 in roughly 12 hours. But similar to the climb from Camp 3 to Camp 4, the group was just moving too slow. Maria was struggling, as they made their way up to the summit, and after reaching the south summit, her body was slowly giving out. This video of Maria just shows how close the summit was from the group, but the final push from the south summit to the top is technical, and the terrain becomes incredibly difficult. It had been 14 hours in the death zone at this point, and Maria and Rob were both suffering from high altitude sickness, and they were low on oxygen, but Rob at summit fever. This is when the idea of reaching the top becomes so tantalizing that he would throw safety out the window, and half lethargic, he would ask Maria if he could continue while she stayed at the south summit with one of the Sherpas. Of course Maria, not wanting to hold back her husband who had dreamt of this moment his entire life, immediately said yes, and it was decided that Rob would continue the climb, eager to finish the final stretch. While Rob continued to climb at 9 a.m., Maria and her Sherpa would turn around and begin the descent back to Camp 4. A few hours later, Rob would stand on the roof of the world, but something was off. Rob realized as he stood on top of the mountain that without Maria, it just wasn't the same. Yes, he had dreamed about this moment since he was a kid, but after meeting his wife, well, his life changed and he wanted to spend those special moments with her. He didn't spend long on the summit, he took one picture and quickly started the descent. But Rob was hallucinating at this point. It is difficult to describe his condition, but it is known that he was hardly able to walk. In fact, he would spend stretches of the route simply sliding, resting, and then trying to walk again. But even at this pace, he was able to eventually make it back to the south summit, where he had originally left Maria. While his wife was on her own descent, both of their recounts of the conditions were very similar. Both groups would slowly take a few steps, fall to the ground, and slide a few more inches before resting. Then they would gather the strength to repeat the process, each time progressing roughly 10 meters. Maria continued pushing for as long as she could, until she just couldn't stand anymore and would have to be carried back to Camp 4. At 2 a.m., nearly 31 hours in the death zone, she would finally make it into a tent with six other climbers. But she was lethargic, unable to listen to anyone, simply demanding to see her husband. Meanwhile, Rob was still descending the mountain, and at one point he would fall asleep on the route. I don't think I need to explain how bad this is, but luckily, another team was pushing for the summit, and they would wake Rob up check his oxygen, which to no surprise was empty. They urged him to continue down the mountain as stopping the death zone. Well, you already know 
When Rob finally stumbled back into Camp 4, he was falling asleep as he walked, but a friend of him urged to talk to Maria, as they were worried about her. Her condition had improved during the night as she was on oxygen and had eaten a little bit, but it was still dangerously negative as they tried to keep her awake. The team was communicating with base camp who was urging the other climbers to keep Maria awake due to the risk of her never waking up again should she fall asleep. They were also trying to coordinate a rescue effort, but in the death zone, there was no way for a rescue team to reach them. So base camp urged the climbers to reach camp 3 if they were to have any chance to save Maria. At 8 a.m. the sun had risen, and Maria had gone through phases of being completely coherent and the next minute hallucinating. But she was able to walk on her own. They had no other choice but to start the descent down the mountain. Their progress was slow as both Rob and Maria were barely able to walk, but they did inch their way down the mountain and eventually out of the death zone, the first positive sign for a rescue. But it was shortly after they finally descended below 8,000 meters that tragedy would strike. One step at a time, Maria was walking until the next step did not come. Maria would slip and entangle herself around the guideline, falling off the route down the mountain a few feet. Rob would cry out and muster the strength to reach her. He would wrap his arms around her, but it was too late. Maria was exhausted and she would pass away in her husband's arms. Rob and the rest of the team would eventually make it off Everest with no incident, but Maria would remain on the mountain for a few more weeks, where she would eventually be taken down and laid to rest by her family. Although Rob would survive the ordeal, he would suffer from a severe case of frostbite, but most of all, he was emotionally damaged. And to this day, he struggles to recount those last few days on the mountain. Listening to him tell some of his story left a lasting impression on me, as it was obvious just how deeply this man cared for his wife and the immense guilt that he felt. But I believe most of all, the words that Maria would speak countless times always rung in my ears when researching this story. To fail is one thing, to quit is another, and I am no quitter. What would you like um, people to know about Marissa? <laughs> Just got to look at the pictures of her. I can't, I still can't look at any pictures of her because It was just under 80 degrees Fahrenheit on July 6, 2015, which meant it was the perfect weather for hiking and sightseeing. And there are a few other better places to do that in Washington state other than the big four ice caves. Annalisa Santana and her brother, David, would be visiting from California and among the crowd that would flock to the trail and eventually the caves to enjoy the perfect weather. The warm weather had begun in May. And by July, the rising temperatures would unfortunately cause a chain of events that would tragically change the lives of both siblings. This is their story. The Big Four Ice Caves lie in the northwest of Washington State, just an hour and 30 minute drive from Seattle. And for a state that lies just under Canada, you would think the temperatures would be cold. And they are, compared to other areas of the United States. But because the Pacific Ocean is so close, there is not a large variability between temperatures, with summer months rarely getting above 80 degrees Fahrenheit and winter months dipping into the 30s at night. So when temperatures do start to hit the 70s and 80s, well, it's time for residents to get out and view the beautiful outdoors. While most people know of Mount Rainier, and for good reason, there are plenty of other trails and sights to see throughout the state. The ice caves lie at the bottom of an avalanche chute on the Big Four Mountains north face. This is a small indentation where snow and water has eroded a path through the rock face, creating a pool of ice at the bottom. The melting snow and wind from avalanches has formed the 3,100 feet of caverns that are maintained year-round due to the shade of the mountain. The caves are unique and that the temperature is enough to dislodge and begin to melt pieces of the cave, creating new offshoots and structures within the ice. But every winter, a new round of snowfall only adds to the structure. It is a never-ending cycle of melting snow and ice to be replenished year after year. To reach one of Washington's most iconic outdoor attractions, you would begin a hike through the trailhead with a very unique name, 
the Big Four Ice Caves Trail. It is considered an easy hike and is just over 2.3 miles round trip. Therefore, there is lots of foot traffic year round. The entire hike takes roughly 30 minutes to reach the caves and 30 minutes back to the parking lot. And there is no cell reception throughout the entire trip, meaning there really is no way to reach the outside world. If you were hiking the trail today, you would come across countless warning signs to stay out of the caves. Warning signs that were missing from their original location in 2010. When John Tam and Tamami Okaoki visited the caves with their two kids, similar to 2015, the temperature was warm in 2010, and this would cause a large chunk of ice the size of a small truck to break away from the primary structure. This chunk of ice would sadly strike 11-year-old Grace Tam. Grace was standing 20 feet away from the cave and waiting for her parents to take a photo when she was struck. Unfortunately, she would lose her life later that day. Grace's family in the state of Washington would establish a memorial and ensure plenty of warning signs were correctly established to prevent any tragic accidents to occur ever again. But of course, even with the signs, every year there are hundreds, if not thousands of individuals that enter the caves. And for a California family visiting the caves in July of 2015, this case was no different. 34-year-old Annalisa Santana, her four children, and fiancé Dustin Wilson were accompanied by Annalisa's 25-year-old brother, David Santana, as they visited the state of Washington for a family vacation. David was also married and had two children with a third on the way. Annalisa and David had spent the early years of their lives in Washington and had some great memories of the state and simply exploring the outdoors. Annalisa desperately wanted to share her memories of the state with her children. And give them the opportunity to create their own. While on vacation, the family had heard multiple times from the residents of the state that the Big Four ice caves were absolutely worth the drive, as there is simply nothing like the caves. Because of all the recommendations and all the great info online, it was a no-brainer for Annalisa and David to make the trip with their family. Those of you with kids can certainly understand just how difficult they can be at times, but taking four on a two mile hike, even if it is considered an easy hike. Yeah, I'm not sure I would want to be in those shoes. But even so, Annalisa thought it was a great opportunity for her family to bond and see the caves together. So after roughly 30 minutes of walking, they finally came into view. The caves stand out as the white texture contrasts against the giant rock that it lies against, especially in the summer when it is the only ice and snow around. At the base of the structure are several caves that quickly disappear into the darkness of the ice, and of course, they couldn't help but notice all the people. There were individuals climbing onto the ice and walking into the caves, even though there are plenty of signs that directly warn against this. As Annalisa and David approached the caves with their family, it was easy to be influenced by the sheer number of people entering the ice. So after taking a couple of pictures from the outside, they would make the decision to enter the structure. The first thing they noticed was the blue ice and the beauty of the cave from the inside. They also felt a deep chill that could be felt in their bones, causing some to even physically shiver as the caves were much colder than the warm temperatures outside. From the outside, everything was normal. There were still plenty of hikers heading towards the caves from the trail and many people stopping to take pictures at the entrance of the cave. But as we have become accustomed to in many of the stories on my channel, in some cases, everything can be fine one minute and the next, all hell can break loose. Those outside heard it first. It was a faint crack that rippled through the air. Then they felt the ground shake as suddenly chunks of ice, some as big as large trucks, began falling from the roof and smashing into the rocks below, ice and snow flying in all directions on impact. It was over almost as quickly as it came, and the ice had once again settled. Because of the rising temperatures that started in May, the ice had become thinner and thinner as it slowly melted until suddenly it was no longer strong enough to hold. An entire shelf of snow and ice would fall on July 6th. Inside the cave, Annalisa and David would be exploring with their families when they heard the crack 
but there was nothing that they could do. Both families, along with several other tourists in the cave, would quickly try to take cover, covering their heads with their arms as they tried to duck behind any rocks they could reach. But unfortunately, there just wasn't enough time, and Elisa was hit by a large slab of ice, and she would lose her life almost immediately. Her brother David would be standing near her and be hit as well, nearly knocking him unconscious. As those who were lucky and uninjured began looking up, the first thing everyone noticed was the sheer amount of ice now on the floor of the cave. Then it would be the few people who still lay on the ground, screaming in pain because of a broken bone or other injury. But the scariest sight was those not making a sound. There were several people unconscious and even more who were injured. Annalise's fiance, Dustin, had injured his leg, but along with several others was helped out of the cave with David and Annalise's four children, but they would be missing one family member. Because of no cell reception, it was difficult to inform anyone, much less rescue teams, as it would take a couple of hikers over 30 minutes till they would reach their vehicle, then another 14 minutes to reach a phone where they could let officials know of the accident. As we commonly see in these types of stories, those first few minutes after the accident are absolutely crucial, and waiting 45 minutes after the cave collapsed could quite literally be the difference between life and death. To put it simply, it is a failure by the state to not have a closer emergency phone. A rescue helicopter would be sent to the cave shortly after the call came in, and their first life flight would be David Santana, who was barely conscious after suffering from blunt force trauma. Dustin and all four of Annalise's children would make their way to the hospital as well. Dustin would have to have a leg surgery, but thankfully, along with Annalise's kids, they would all five make a full recovery. I wish I could say the same about David, as he would battle in critical care for three months before he too would pass away from his injuries. David would leave behind his wife, and three kids. Annalisa and David were both described as caring and loving people, especially when it came to their families. They were known for having huge hearts, and that can certainly be seen in the story, as all they wanted to do was genuinely give their kids memories that they could cherish forever, but everything can change in just one second. It would be two days before Annalise's body would be removed from the back of the caves, and it was a tedious process as rescue teams had to be wary of another collapse, but thankfully, there were no more accidents. The Big Four Ice Caves would be closed for months as the state reassessed how they would keep the public safe. Eventually, they would begin the process of installing closer emergency landlines to the cave, so if there ever was another collapse, rescue teams could reach the caves significantly quicker. They also established even more warning signs telling tourists to stay out of the caves. But since it is not illegal to enter, to this day there are still thousands of hikers every single year that roll the dice. I know the state can only do so much, but this still feels like a failure to me, as two innocent lives were lost and families were changed forever, yet the changes, while needed, are simply just not severe enough to prevent another accident from ever happening again. While I wish that on nobody, unfortunately, I see it as only a matter of time. The 1939 American Karakoram expedition to K2 has been described as one of the worst tragedies in climbing history. It certainly is one of the most controversial expeditions to date, with K2 being notorious as one of the hardest 8,000 meter peaks to summit. There are many technical aspects of the climb, and the location of the mountain is perfect for storms to accumulate around it. But what if you were only 800 feet from the summit, and without your knowledge, men below began removing the supplies and camps below you? leaving you to fend for yourself on the descent. Well, that's exactly what happened to Fritz Wiesner, Pasong Dawi Lama, and Dudley Wolf. This is their story. Our story actually begins in 1937, when the British colonial authorities approved a plan to reach the summit in 1938 and 1939. 
1938 expedition was key in expanding their knowledge and would lay the groundwork for all future ventures going forward. It would be one of the first times British and American climbers had traveled to K2. They were able to figure out what the best route to take up the mountain was, which would later become known as the Abruzzi Spur Route. They would identify key areas where supplies and tents could be established, and they would also learn where some of the more technical climbs were located to better prepare themselves. It paved the way for the 1939 expedition, which could not have taken place without this knowledge. Fritz Wiesner was a German rock climber who had settled in America and had been living there for over 10 years. In that time, he would gain his citizenship as well as complete some of the first ascents of multiple mountains in the Alps. Wiesner was one of the only individuals at the time that had attempted a climb on Nanga Parbat, marking him as a man who had actual experience on an 8000er in the country before 1938. So he was an obvious choice to lead the 1939 expedition. Unfortunately, America was still recovering from the Great Depression, so there was not a lot of funding to go around, and those that did have the money typically were not experienced mountaineers, so they had to look outside of the mountaineering community to raise the funds. Just by a random chance, Wiesner had been invited to Dudley Wolfe's party in 1938. Now Wolfe had inherited most of his wealth in the range of 700 to 800 million US dollars today. As soon as the two met, they began sharing stories about their youth and how they enjoyed the outdoors. Dudley became fascinated in hearing about Wiesner's climbs, and as soon as he told him about K2, he was hooked. Despite his inexperience, he was eager to join and fund the entire expedition. So in December of 1938, Dudley boarded the Georgic and sailed to Austria. He would spend a few months with his divorced wife before setting out to England, where he met Wiesner in March 1939. Since England had the best mountaineering supply in the world at the time, the pair would load up on climbing equipment. They would meet four other climbers that would be joining them for the expedition, and all six would set off by ship together. The ship landed on April 10th in Bombay, India, and the team traveled the rest of the way by train to Sringar. As they traveled, drama began to form between Wiesner and another climber named Durrance. As Wiesner felt that Durrance would not listen or respect some of his decisions, but there was no turning back now, so the two just had to make do. By the end of April 9th, Sherpas had joined the team in Sringar, and once they were all together, they began their month-long hike to K2. Porters had been pre-selected and ended up carrying most of the gear to base camp. The team was very enthusiastic along the hike as spirits were high, and by the end of May they had made it to the mountain. Unfortunately, a day after base camp was established, Canmer, one of the original six men, and probably the second best climber out of the group behind Wiesner, got very sick and was close to death. Fortunately, he would recover, but this would mark the end of his participation. Wiesner would be the one leading the climb, and the healthy men would follow him up the mountain. While at base camp, he also served as the organizational leader, but once the real work started, this was harder for him to do, especially the higher up they went. Since Canmer was too sick to do much, Wiesner appointed a man named Cromwell to manage the details from below. It was determined that due to his responsibilities, Cromwell would go no further than the location of Camp 4. Durrance forgot his climbing boots, so he was forced to wait until supplies from porters came in, which did not help his already damaged relationship with Wiesner. The first major task that the men faced was establishing Camp 4. Now remember, all of the camp locations had been pre-planned, so the men had an advantage that the previous expedition did not. The climb began on June 8th, but the progress was slow due to the large amount of gear they had to haul up, and the fact that Cromwell was not taking charge. But by June 19th, they had managed to reach their designated camp site. During this climb, Wolf quickly became Wiesner's favorite, partly because he was funding the majority of the expedition, but also because Wolf was a hard worker that never complained. Although his inexperience did prove to be a safety hazard as the other climbers had to keep a close eye on him, this caused frustration from those that had to support him as it felt like they were just babysitting the money. Two days after Camp 4 was set up, a severe storm settled on the mountain, causing temperatures to drop to negative 2 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 19 degrees Celsius. Lower on the mountain, the wind reached gusts of 80 miles an hour as everyone was forced to take shelter. The storm would last for eight days, and on July 29th, it suddenly stopped. A much needed reprieve as the men had begun to become discouraged, but during the storm, Cromwell had been injured in a fall and another man, apart from the original six, named Sheldon, developed frostbite on his toes. Both men were excluded in their work as they wouldn't be very helpful to the team for about two weeks. 
At this time, Durris finally received his climbing boots, so the men tasked a Sherpa to carry a note up to Wiesner. On July 1st, Wiesner and Wolf would continue the climb to set up Camp 5 at 6,705 meters. It was at this location that the Sherpa handed Wiesner the note about Durrance, but there seemed to be a misunderstanding based on his reply. You see, Wiesner had thought Durrance received his boots on June 21st, when he actually received them on June 28th. With that in mind, the leader told Durrance that he was very disappointed in him, which was taken as an attack on his character. But what Wiesner did not know was that the men below really took a liking to Durrance because he had been contributing the most when it came to carrying supplies and the morale at base camp. The note caused an instant rift, with most members in the expedition against Wiesner. Wolf was beginning to be the only ally that the expedition leader really had. A three-day storm had prevented the team from going any further, but once it had passed, Wiesner, along with a few Sherpas, climbed to Camp 6. The very next day, they traversed the Black Pyramid, a section of jagged rocks to reach the top of the Abruzzi Ridge and established Camp 7 at 7,529 meters. Wolf had remained at Camp 5 awaiting orders, and since no supplies had been brought up the mountain, Wiesner would descend back down to Camp 2 to inform the team of their progress. Durrance, Cromwell, a man named Trench, and six Sherpas were all excited to learn about what Wiesner had accomplished and were eager to see it for themselves. Following the trail that had been laid out, all the men at Camp 2 ascended to Camp 5 without issues, but the climb was taxing and the men were exhausted by the time that they had reunited with Wolf. Unfortunately, Wolf had started to develop frostbite on his toes, and Durrance advised him to descend the mountain. However, Wiesner was against this and convinced Wolf to continue, citing that Durrance was just jealous an inexperienced climber had made it this far. All the men climbed together to Camp 6, but Wolf was struggling and greatly relied on those around him for assistance. On July 13th, they would all continue to Camp 7, but once they made it, Durrance was too exhausted to continue, and he would end up descending back to Camp 4, along with four other Sherpas. While the men were climbing, two Sherpas went ahead and set up Camp 8 in preparation. So after reaching Camp 7, Wiesner, Wolf, and three Sherpas continued upwards to join them. Once they reached Camp 8, another brutal storm settled on the mountain and would last eight days. The men's supplies were severely stretched at this point, and the Sherpas began to worry about having enough left to reach the summit. However, Wiesner and Wolf almost had a contagious joy about them, as they were overly excited to have reached this point. Once the storm had passed, two Sherpas were sent down to let the other men know that supplies were needed, and to begin ferrying what they could up the mountain. Once the Sherpas walked into Camp 4, they were greeted by Durrance, who was now suffering from the early stages of hypoxia and cerebral edema. Although he still was strong enough to descend to Camp 2 with the help from the Sherpas. But once they reached camp, Durrance was horrified with what he saw. The entire place was a mess, and the men had no idea what they were doing. Cromwell and Trench were completely checked out of the expedition and had no desire to do anything more. This only damaged the relationship between Wiesner and the men more as they began to think that he had abandoned them, despite still being on the mountain. While the organizational disaster occurred below, Wiesner and Wolf were sitting at Camp 8 preparing for a summit bid. They believed supplies would begin ferrying up towards them, but down below there had been a huge mistake overlooked. Many of the Sherpas did not speak English, so when they were given instructions, half the time they did not understand, and this proved to be disastrous for those still in high altitude. I also want to note that by this time, Wolf had been above 6,000 meters and higher for over 26 days. The risk of staying at high altitudes for an extended period of time was not known as well as it is today. In fact, his extended stay on the mountain is unheard of in recent times. An aspect that makes K2 much harder to climb a mountain such as Everest is that the technicality of the route becomes increasingly more difficult the higher up you go. Simply put, Wolf did not have the experience to continue, nor did he have the strength anymore. So it was decided that he would remain at Camp 8 while Wiesner and fellow Sherpa attempted the summit. And on the morning of July 17th, the pair made some progress traversing difficult areas of K2 and would eventually settle in for the night as they created Camp 9 around 7,900 meters. The summit was only 670 meters away, and on July 19th, they would set out again. 
but this time, Wiesner and his Sherpa, Pasong Lama, were faced with a difficult challenge. They had seen the infamous bottleneck from a distance and decided to go away from it, not knowing that while it is intimidating, it is truly the easier route. Their other option would be to traverse a very technical rock climb to the left of the bottleneck. This route is hardly ever taken on K2, even with the most experienced climbers. They spent over nine hours trying to traverse the rocks, until eventually Pasong Lama could go no further. Surprisingly, they managed to reach 8,370 meters, only being a mere 240 meters away from the summit. It is ironic, because they just spent their entire day traveling the more difficult path, only to stop when the rest of the way was actually very simple. Nevertheless, they descended back to Camp 9, but along the way, Pasong lost his crampons, a crucial device used to walk on snow and ice. The following day, July 21st, the pair attempted to climb again, this time through the bottleneck. But they did not make much progress and quickly abandoned the attempt, as Pasong Lama could not climb without his crampons. While all this was going on, there were four Sherpas that were tasked with carrying supplies up to the various camps. Although there was some misunderstanding between the Sherpas and the American men, which caused nothing to get done. It was not until July 20th that the Sherpas would climb up to Camp 7 to gather information on Wiesner, Wolf, and Pasong Lama. However, they never reached Camp 8, where Wolf was located. Instead, they shouted from Camp 7 and waited for a response, but there would be none as Wiesner was still at Camp 9, while Wolf rested at Camp 8, so the Sherpas began to assume that the others had already perished on the peak. There were signs of an avalanche, but this would be a completely wrong assumption. With only three days left in the expedition, the four Sherpas decided to return to base camp, but not before stripping Camp 7, 6, and 5 as they descended, thinking that they were helping the men below. While this was occurring, Durrance and a few Sherpas were moving supplies down from the lower camps back to base camp. The porters were expected to arrive on July 23rd, and they wanted to be prepared. The men at base camp expected Wiesner, Wolf, and five Sherpas to be returning, but only four Sherpas walked into camp that day. Wiesner had not been heard from since July 14th, and the team assumed the worst. Durrance surprisingly showed great concern and wanted to wait and confirm Wiesner's whereabouts, but the Sherpas that had climbed up to Camp 7 convinced him that they were no longer alive. Wiesner and Pasong Lama would descend on July 22nd with the expectation that they would be resupplying before another summit attempt, but after reaching Camp 8, they were horrified with what they found. Wolf had been alone this entire time, and there had been no resupply of the camp. All three men no longer had any matches, which meant that they could not cook food or melt ice, and this caused all of them to descend to Camp 7 together. But along the way, Wolf almost fell to his death due to exhaustion, losing his sleeping bag in the process. The only reason that he was alive is due to a fixed rope attached to Pasong Lama. However, their troubles did not stop there. Once the men reached Camp 7, they realized that no help would be coming. The campsite was practically non-existent, as the tent was buried under snow, and most of the supplies were gone. Luckily, there was a stove with fuel that ended up saving all of their lives that night. Wolf's condition was so dire that he would not be able to descend further without additional help. So the next day, Wiesner and Pasong left Wolf at Camp 7, descending K2. Camp after camp, they made their way down the mountain, finding very little food or shelter along the way, almost like ghosts walking in the night until eventually they made it back on July 24th. Pasong was barely able to walk and was in worse condition than Wiesner, who was understandably furious at all the men accusing them of abandoning him on the mountain. It was a disastrous scene as Cromwell took offense and feeling ashamed began accusing Wiesner of abandoning Wolf. Durrance recognized that this was going nowhere and tried to calm everyone down as they needed to form a plan for Wolf quickly. Base camp had already been packed up in preparation for the porters and Cromwell was assisting them in leading the equipment back to Askol, while Durrance along with three Sherpas would ascend K2. It took two days for them to reach Camp 4, but once they arrived, Durrance and a fellow Sherpa were too exhausted to continue and therefore the other two Sherpas named Pasong Qatar and Fisno climbed up to Camp 6 together. The next day, two more Sherpas named Pasong Kikulumo and Sering Norbu would make quick work of the mountain and reach Camp 6 in just under a day, a feat that would not be repeated for decades. 
On July 29, Kakulu, Qatar, and Feast Snow found Wolf alive at Camp 7, completely apathetic and in terrible condition. He was covered in his own urine and feces, with no food or water left. Wolf refused to move and was adamant about staying for the night, telling the Sherpas that he would be ready tomorrow. Not knowing what to do, the Sherpas descended back to Camp 6, where Norbu was waiting. I want to note that by this time, Wolf had spent 38 days above 6,700 meters and 16 days above 7,000 meters. The effects that this had on his brain is hard to say, but we now know that humans are not suited for extended stays at such high altitudes. Disaster would strike the next day as a storm settled on the mountain and would last two days. On July 31st, Kakulu, Qatar, and Fisno would set off Camp 7 to rescue Wolf. None of these men were ever seen alive again. After the Sherpas failed to come down that night, Norbu returned to base camp to deliver the news. Wiesner was quick to dismiss his claims and even attempted to start another rescue attempt, but it never really gained any traction, so it's not worth digging into. In 1995, all three Sherpa remains were found on the Godwin-Austin Glacier, and in 2002, Wolf's remains, along with his tent, were found on the same glacier, but at an entirely different location. This would mean that the Sherpas were not with Wolf at the time of their deaths, so it's safe to assume that they had died either trying to reach Wolf or descending without him. Either way, the Savage Mountain once again reminds us of the brutality of nature. Critics of Wiesner would continue well into the 1950s, until a book was released detailing the expedition more closely. There had been mixed opinions in the mountaineering community as to who deserved the blame for the four deaths, continuing even today. I don't believe it matters who is right or wrong, I just think that Wolf was not ready to take on the Savage Mountain, a mistake that he and the others paid the ultimate price for. Poland's Jerzy Kokuczka was a legendary alpine-style climber who would become the second person ever to summit all 14 8,000er peaks. However, in 1989, Jerzy would find himself on the unclimbed south face of Lotse, hanging by a single rope with only 250 meters left to go before reaching the summit. This is his story. Jerzy Kokotska was widely considered one of the greatest high-altitude climbers in history, and it's not really up for debate. He was born in Katowice, Poland in 1948, and discovered rock climbing at the age of 17, when a friend invited him to tag along to climb a small limestone wall. As soon as the young Kokotska was on the wall, he knew climbing would have a big impact on his life and between the ages of 17 to 19, it would be his entire focus. Through hard work and a little bit of natural talent, Jerzy quickly became a strong rock climber. But it wasn't until Jerzy joined the Karavica Mountaineering Club in 1966 where his mountaineering career really took off. It was in this club that Jerzy wound up finding future climbing partners and being introduced to the Tatras Mountains, where he would really begin to develop his alpine style of climbing that he was famous for. This style was popular during the time period and is highly regarded as the purest form of mountaineering. Instead of hauling loads of gear up the mountain with the intention of longer periods of stay, one would ascend and descend as fast as their body could take them. For the next five years, Jerzy was either going to trade school or practicing his skills. He did not have any money, so the only way for Jerzy to venture outside of Poland was to raise capital either through manual labor or shady business practices. And using his talents the only way he knew how, he found work as an industrial climber. Despite his monetary struggles, it was clear that Jerzy had a natural talent for mountaineering, as each year he progressively accomplished more difficult routes on the Tatras Mountains. But it really was in 1971 and 1972 when Jerzy climbed two of the hardest and longest routes on the range, and the winner, I might add, that his name really became known in Poland. I won't go into too much detail on his accomplishments before the 8000ers, but between 1971 and 1979, Jerzy would go on to make a name for himself abroad, with successful summits on the Dolomites in Italy, to climbing Mont Blanc four times in one trip, to conquering Mount Denali in Alaska, and even climbing a new route on the Grandes Jorises during his honeymoon. 
Yerge continued to develop his skills. Most notably though, he had a real knack for being comfortable in colder climates, which would translate to many different winter summits in his career. In fact, he would become so good at climbing in the winter that he was invited to join a select Polish climbing group called the Ice Warriors. They were a small group of climbers that were the best that Poland had to offer with the goal of making a name for themselves. The group specialized in winter summits, but also uncovering new routes which Yerge discovered that he loved. The challenge of climbing something that has never been done before appealed to him, and unsurprisingly, he would become one of the best in the world at it. Anytime he approached an expedition, he would always consider if a new route could be taken to reach the summit. This would be really noticeable in the latter half of his climbing career, where his main focus was to summit all 14 8,000ers. Yerge would spend 1979 through 1988 tackling the tallest mountains in the world, he would spend months at a time in different countries just to fly back to Poland to raise funds and do it all over again. Because of the monetary struggles, Yerge had to be creative and managed to cut costs by crafting his own climbing equipment, something that many people have indifferent opinions on, but I'll let you come to your own conclusions on that fact. Nevertheless, the next 10 years, Yerge was on top of the world, quite literally. He would end up successfully summiting all 8,000 er peaks in just under 7 years, which I might add was a world record for the shortest time to summit all of the mountains until it was broken in 2014. But what really separated Yerge from everyone else was not necessarily what he did, but how he did it. Not only did he successfully reach the summit, but he established new routes on 10 of the 14 8000 er peaks, a record that still stands today and will probably never be broken. Just to add to the craziness, four of these summits were done in the middle of winter, and among those four, three of them, Dalagiri, Kanchenjunga, and Annapurna 1, would be the first time anyone had reached the summit during the winter. But perhaps the most impressive feat that he accomplished was his summit of the unclimbed south face of K2. Yerge, along with a fellow alpine mountaineer, Tadusz Piotrowski, managed to establish a new route on K2 in 1986. The south face is littered with giant seracs, and easily the most avalanche prone section on the mountain. In fact, it is so dangerous that it has been called suicidal by many, and thus, there has never been another attempt. Let me say this again, there has never been another attempt. Yerge himself described the climb as the most difficult in his career, and finding a new route on K2 catapulted his climbing status to being one of the greatest of all time. However, the accomplishments was dampened when Yerge's climbing partner, Piotrowski, lost his crampons while descending and fell to his death. Overall, the 1986 K2 season was brutal, as there were 13 deaths total, so Yerge did not receive much recognition at first, but was later recognized for the accomplishment. There is simply no denying everything that he did, as there is a reason he is considered one of the greatest climbers of all time. But even a man so proficient on high altitude climbs will still face danger. After Yerge accomplished something never done before, reached the peaks of the 14 tallest mountains in the world, fought through the cold of winter, and established new routes in some of the most hospitable places on our planet, he still wanted more. He took a look back at his career and set his sights on the very first 8000 er peak he summited back in 1979, Lotse. During the time, he followed the conventional west face route, so it was nothing to diminish, but to a man like Yerge, the normal route was just not enough. It was decided that he would revisit the peak, but this time, attempting to climb from the most difficult section, the south face. The south face of Lotse is a staggering wall of sheer verticality that towers over the trek to the Everest base camp. Many climbers at the time said one of the greatest alpine walls in the world is impossible, and that is exactly why Yerge wanted to take on the challenge. While others claim it is the final major Himalayan difficult climb lift in the time period, I want to give some perspective here and state that the south face consists of a vertical rock wall with ice that stretches for 3,300 meters during the climb. The wall is considered one of the hardest yet greatest vertical climbs in the world. It towers over the Everest base camp, intimidating even the best. Any type of mistake that is made is magnified, and being on that wall when bad weather rolls in means certain death. 
After working for a few months in Poland, Jerzy would gather enough funds for his attempt. A climber by the name of Rizard Polowski would join him as they planned for an alpine-style climb. The pair would travel to Kathmandu in the summer of 1989, where they stocked up on additional climbing equipment. The markets there were accustomed to mountaineers, so they had plenty of supplies. But most of the town was poor, so it was common that second-hand equipment was sold, which is a dangerous realization as alpinists relied on their gear, and if something was defective, such as a rope or crampons, it could be disastrous. Once Jerzy and Polowski were satisfied with their gear, they trekked to Everest's base camp, which stood just below the south wall of Lhotse. Unfortunately, during their journey, weather was an issue, and they certainly would not attempt the climb if an opportunity did not present itself. So they waited, and waited, and waited some more. All the pair needed was a couple of days, and finally in October, after a few months had passed, the weather finally began to give them an opportunity, and on October 23rd, they started their climb. Jerzy and Polowski flew up the mountain, making incredible progress. Those below were lucky to watch such elite climbers perform their art as the duo would finish the first day on the mountain uneventful. They set up a bivouac around 8,200 meters, only 300 meters away from the summit. Like most summit attempts, the morning before the final push starts early, and most times before the sun rises to give climbers enough time to reach the top, and make their way back down to safety. This climb was no different, as Jerzy and Polowski started preparing for the push well before they could see a ray of sunlight. They quickly ate and began the final push, which consisted of a blank slab of rock that did not have support from below. One wrong move, and you are free falling for over 2,000 meters. Jerzy took point, but they quickly realized that there was a problem. The single main rope that they had been using up until this point was jammed from below, and there was no way that they would be able to utilize it for the upcoming climb. Instead, Jerzy pulled out a transport rope that he bought at the Kathmandu market. The rock was treacherous, and it was clear from the jump that this is by far the most difficult area of the mountain. It was shortly after they started climbing the rock face when Jerzy took a fatal step and slipped almost instantly starting to tumble down the mountain. The transport rope attached to Jerzy was his last hope, but it snapped under his weight, plunging him down the mountain to his death. Polowski could do nothing but sit there in shock over what just happened. It took a minute to process everything, and then came the fear for his own life. He was not as strong of a climber as Jerzy, and not only did he just witness his friend fall to his death, but he was also still in this unclimbed, deadly rock. Polowski had years of experience and would need every ounce of it, but he did manage to reach camp safely that night. The news was delivered, and the community wept for losing such a great climber, but an even greater man. Jerzy would leave behind a wife and two children. One of them, his son, would follow in his footsteps and later summit Everest. This death was a challenging one for me, as I would think such a great climber would have a good understanding of his equipment, but I was not on that mountain, so I don't deserve to judge what happened. I just hope this story reminds us of how precious life can be, and how great of a climber Jerzy Kukuczka truly was.